Hey everyone, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. Um, tonight we have Nicole Winkles. Um, she's joining us from Ontario, Canada. And tonight we're going to be talking about her setup and her birds and something she likes to call quality over quantity. Uh, the show is going to run till 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, so get your questions in early um, so we can get to all of them. And if you would, please type the letter Q in front of your questions. That just helps me distinguish the, uh, the comments from the questions. Uh, I want to apologize for missing last week Tuesday. Um, I got a big project going on over here and I overworked my back and I didn't think I could sit for an hour. So apologize for that. And that's why we are running the show tonight. Uh, so we didn't get behind on the, uh, the show. Um, I do have a few announcements that I would like to make before we get started. Uh, first off, a uh, shout out to Southwest Game Birds and Michael Rose. Uh, he sent me this t-shirt. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you can check out his website at, uh, I believe it's southwestgamebirds.com. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can find him over on Facebook. He's, he's on there quite a bit on the uh, Caternix Corner group page. <clears throat> um, let's see. I've got a, now that I've got my projects all finished up, um, I do have a lot of projects for the channel that I'm going to be working on next week. Um, we have a incubator review video coming out um, on the incubator that uh, Hatching Time sent us. And I know there's quite a few people out there that want to uh, hear a little bit about that. So that'll be coming up. I got some cage build videos coming up and, and some other stuff. So uh, yeah, that should all be happening uh, first part of next week. Also, um, Turnix Corner Live is booked through June 15th. Um, next week, Tuesday, May 25th, is Allie from Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. Uh, June 1st is Zach Green from My Star Farm. Uh, June 8th is Tamara Roselle. Uh, she's going to be talking about quail genetics, so that ought to be really interesting. And June 15th is Heather Cole, and we're going to be doing a uh, Winola Ranch cage system uh, review. So that ought to be pretty interesting, too. Um, we are giving away two of the Caternix Corner live tumblers tonight, and they will go to the two people who asked the most engaging questions of the night for our guest. So, uh, like I say, make sure you put a Q in front of your question, and uh, the two people that, that uh, asked the most engaging questions will get a uh, Caternix Corner live tumbler. Um, and also, those tumblers are available on CaternixCorner.com if you want to purchase one. They are $35 a piece, and that includes shipping. Um, let's see. Oh, also, um, our guest and uh, Kristen run a uh, live stream over on the Caternix Corner Facebook group page, and that is Caternix Quail 101, and that runs every Saturday at 7 p.m., so check that out. If you're not a member of the uh, group page, uh, go ahead and join that, and we'll get you right in there. Um, tonight, our moderator is Verna Young. Uh, she keeps things running nice and smoothly in the chat room, so thank you, Verna. I really appreciate it. And I won't forget to text you if we cancel another live stream. Um, okay, and the last shout out I want to give is to my wife. Um, she bought me something really cool. And I have my own street now, Caternix Corner Boulevard. So that's going to be hanging behind me on the wall um, in the near future. So let's see. Um, I think that's about it for the announcements. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, get the show started. Hello, Nicole. Hi, how are you? Good, welcome to the show. Well, I'm glad to be on. Yeah, I'm, finally we got you in here. Um, if you would, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Nicole Winkles, and I am from uh, Essex County in Ontario, Canada. Um, I 
have three children, and my husband and I, we run our, um, our farm here, Essex County Quail and Poultry. So we have quail and chickens and ducks and um, geese, and the kids have their own rabbit business. So, um, yeah, it keeps us all pretty busy. Yep, great. Um, tell us a little bit about your operation, the, the quail, you know, the size of your operation, the color of birds you keep, and what other type of animals you keep besides the quail. So for the quail, we have our flock is about 400 right now. Um, in various colors. I have them all separated by uh, colors and um, we're hoping to increase our flock size to about a thousand by the end of the year um, just because we've had so many people that um, are ordering and are interested in eggs locally and all across Canada for shipping. So um, yeah, that's my main goal this summer is to work on building up my flock size so that by fall time when we can start shipping eggs again when it gets a little bit cooler that I'll have the uh, the ability to supply the, the demand that's out there and um, I also sell um, chicken and duck hatching eggs and um, yeah so it keeps me pretty busy and you also play piano yes I do <laughs> I love that little thing you posted on uh, Facebook. Okay, um, I understand you guys just moved to a new farm. Um, are you planning on expanding your quail operation now that you're out there? Yeah, we, um, so we moved um, April 15th. We just got this new farm, so it's taken us some time to get everything organized. I'm still not at the point where I feel like everything's where it should be, but at least everything has a spot and I can, you know, work with what's there right now and continue to improve it um, and you know it's been a, a real blessing because at our other place I was in a, um, a two-car garage basically for my quail operation and then um, yeah we just outgrew it way too fast and this place came up and by the grace of God we got it um, considering the real estate market that's in Ontario right now so it was uh, it was quite a, an unexpected blessing, and we were just really, really thankful that it all worked out. Nice, very nice. Um, you mentioned quality over quantity. What does that mean in your operation? Um, for me, I when I look for my breeders, I want to, um, well, for one thing, I look for weights um, and longevity and um, just, a really good strong bird for breeding but I also look for um, I guess not so much I don't know if you'd call it personality but a lot of people around here they want pet quails so I have some that um, you know can be on the aggressive side and I take those out of my out of my breeding um, and concentrate more on you know the friendlier birds that aren't going to beat each other up and a lot of people have, you know, I've gotten lots of feedback um, from customers that have hatched out eggs that say, like, your quail are really friendly. Like, what do you do <laughs> to them? <laughs> so I try to breed aggression out of the flocks, and, I, and especially by keeping, um, you know, a, a good varying amount of different bloodlines as well. I find that really helps cut down on the aggression. So, um, yeah, weights are definitely a big thing for my jumbo lines and then um, yeah the friendliness and non-aggression is another thing that I, I really look for as well and then of course the color purity I try to get my colors um, you know proper and get the you know the recessive genes out of there as much as I can mm -hmm. so that they breed true or breed however they're supposed to depending right. on their on their colors. Um, that kind of goes into my next question. Um, using the quality over quantity idea, uh, does that affect the way that you select breeders and, and whatnot? Yeah, so basically just by doing the traits that I said with the, um, the weights and the, uh, the friendliness and non-aggression and things like that. I also look for um, the egg laying ability as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I have a pen that I've grown out and 
they're just they're not laying early and they're just not a very good layer I generally will just use those for for meat purposes or something like that and I don't breed that into my flock because I want to keep the egg production up as well sure um, right now I, I've seen it on a couple different live streams I've read it a few times online on the different uh, you know Caternix quail uh, Facebook group pages there's a lot of talk about a standard of perfection um, for Caternix. What are your thoughts on that? Um, do you think it's needed? Or? Well, I breed um, for a show quality poultry for chickens, and having a standard to go by is definitely something that's very, very useful when you're um, picking out your poultry that you want to, um, you know, develop your specific traits that go along with the standard of perfection so mm -hmm. I feel personally that to have one for quail would be very beneficial um, but I think the problem you're going to run into is people are going to have different ideas of what the standard of perfection should be so if it should be for weight or if it should be for color or right. you know body um, stance and uh, you know uh, the proportions and things like that so it's definitely going to take some time to to sort it all out, but I think mm -hmm. definitely it's a it's a good idea to to try and get one in place for sure. Right. Yeah, I know. Um, back when we raised rabbits years ago, when I was a kid, we had they were all show rabbits, all pedigree show rabbits, and we had to follow the standard of perfection. I know um, a lot of people are concerned that by, uh, I won't say a lot of people, I've heard a few people say that by having some type of a standard of perfection for quail is gonna open up doors where it's gonna make them more regulated, so they're kinda concerned with that. Do you think that, that would happen with that? I don't think so. Um, I mean, the real reason why a lot of things are regulated in towns for bylaw purposes, if that's what you're referring to, is mainly, I know for the city of Windsor, they don't allow poultry, but their reasoning is because of rats. Mm -hmm. um, it causes a lot of problems. So I don't think by adopting a standard of perfection, it would change anything, you know, for, for city bylaws or anything for keeping quail or anything to that sort. Yeah. Um, I know for Ontario, you can't sell uninspected meat, no matter what it is. So, um, yeah, it wouldn't make a difference really for, for for anybody in Ontario. I know that, but yeah, and I think mainly that it would be the the fanciers that kept, you know, like some of the more rare colors of quail, um, the colors that are coming out, the newer stuff. I don't think that it would really affect jumbo lines as much because. I mean, jumbo lines, all you're worried about is size for meat and size for eggs. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think it would really affect that that much. Okay, um, Nicole, I got those uh, images that you sent me. I'm going to go ahead and bring them up. And if you want to talk a little bit about each one of them and, uh, yeah, let us know what we're looking at. Well, this is our new barn. So I went from a 20 by 26 barn to a 100 by 30 barn. Um, so I can fit a lot more birds in it and um, so on the left side there you'll see the little opening with the um, with the lights in it that's my the section where I keep my quail and um, yeah the other side we use for the poultry and, and waterfowl so it's definitely a lot more useful for us for what we what we need to do um, the kids love it too having the big a big barn and we're gonna repair the hayloft in there and put up a bunch of hay and put some slides and stuff in there eventually too so oh. that'll be fun yeah I saw the photos that you posted on Facebook of the kids with the animals and that was so cute yeah oh they love it yeah, this has been a an 11 year dream for my husband and I so we finally got the farm that we've been wanting for, for a long time sweet so um, this here is my quail room. It's changed since this photo. I should have taken an updated photo because we got some new cages in but for my bantams. Um, mm -hmm. So on the left side, I keep my bantam chickens, um, my ornamental bantams. Um, and then on the right side, 
is where all my quail are, and everything's um, on rollout trays for the eggs and um, automatic. Uh, waterers. I don't have automatic feeders. They're just the trays that sit in, in the front of the cages. Um, but yeah, the to do the quail chores, it doesn't take very long mm -hmm. to do them. And then we clean the trays. They're all on trays. Um, so we bring uh, our, our, our little trash in. No, they're not. They are made by a, a guy that's about three hours away from me. He does commercial rabbit cages. Oh, okay. um, and I got in contact with him, and he's uh, he was making the quail cages, and then um, I worked with him a little bit to, you know, kind of perfect the design for the feeders and and things like that. So I've bought all my cages from him because it's um, just I just don't have the time to make them, and he does a really really excellent job, very good quality cages. Yeah, now they look nice. Um, this is my. Um, the beginnings of my storefront. Um, I was working on that a little bit more today too. So um, we have another uh, garage that I've turned into my storefront where I have my egg cartons and then I'll have my quail egg scissors and I'm also bringing in some uh, feeders and waterers so I'm just waiting on that shipment to come in too so that when people come to pick up their hatching eggs or their chicks they can have the supplies there to purchase as well and um, you know if they need egg cartons for for their quail that are laying they can just come to the store and, and pick them up so that's yeah that's been exciting too to have a spot where people can actually come in and um, you know see the product firsthand and be sure. able to to walk out the door with it so it's, it's been pretty cool sure here we go all right, and this is my incubating room. This is another part of the garage. So I have um, the fridge that's there beside the two uh, sportsman incubators. I ac I accidentally turned it into an incubator. Um, it was a it was an egg storage fridge that I had set at uh, 50, 55 degrees for egg storage, and then somebody during the move or moving something they um, they knocked the thermostat plug out and it wasn't um, kicking the fridge in to cool it and it got up to 99.5 so when I opened the fridge and checked the temperature all my eggs were in there at 99.5 so like okay um, I'm going to turn this into an incubator and try hatching this batch of eggs that's in here so now I have my uh, Inkford thermostat set at 99.5 and it kicks the fridge on if it gets a little bit too hot and I've got a fan in there and a pan of water and I've been turning the eggs on their trays, like melting the trays twice a day and so far I've got probably about 90% of them have, have developed and are uh, due to hatch um, next week. Cool. So. And there's the eggs. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a bunch of eggs. I sell a lot um, in bulk to uh, chefs in the area, so um, a lot of times they'll, you know, they'll pick up 200 eggs at a time. Um, but yeah, mainly my eggs are um, shipped all across Canada for other people to incubate, and then locally I'll I'll sell them uh, fresh eggs for for eating as well. But this was an order for a chef that I had brought out and was going to go get them all organized. And I checked them all for um, for cracks or and holes and things like that too to make sure that none are broken. Sure. So, and this is uh, one of my last hatches that we had. I had a bunch of um, let's see, what do I see in there? Italians and fees and um, Egyptians and. I think I, yeah, there was a lot of um, autumn ambers and uh, silvers and things like that in there too. So that a good, a good hatch of a bunch of different colors there. And generally, I get a pretty good hatch rate on my own eggs, yeah. but shipping off obviously will will affect that. Um, this is one of our weekly, well, probably twice a week. 
we go through all our eggs and um, yeah figure out which ones are eating eggs, which ones are hatching eggs, which ones are eggs for orders, which ones are, um, you know, cracked and going in the compost and things like that. So that's my little, my youngest helper there on the counter with me. <laughs> are she's, those goose eggs? Very much. Back? Yeah, those are, those are the goose eggs. Cool. Yeah. There's a bird. And this is, this is one of my calico females. Um, Calicos are probably one of my favorite colors. I really, really like them. They're very sweet, have very nice personalities, but they also get up to a pretty decent jumbo size as well. So mm -hmm. they're a very nice dual-purpose bird and really good layers too. So I really like them. And this is one of my blacks. Um, I did have some issues with the blacks with aggression, so I, I'm only down to a pair right now, and I'm working on bringing in some new blood into them. So I've got them crossed with some Tibetans right now to try and, um, some Jumbo Tibetans to try and get them, you know, get the weights up and then get some some of the aggression taken out of them. So that's that's still a, a labor of, of love right now. Yeah. I just put 60 blacks into lockdown today. Oh, nice. Yeah, let's see what we get out of it. Yeah. This is one of my sparklies. Um, I really, really like them. I just got them um, back in November, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a new color to us, but I really love the patterns in there. Um, they get up to a jumbo size as well, so that's really nice. Okay, great. Okay, I think that's it for the images. Um, looks like we're getting a lot of questions in already, so let's go ahead and... Uh, dive right into those so we can try to get as many of them in tonight as we can. Let's see, I gotta get me back up to the top here. Okay guys, if you would uh, remember to uh, type the letter Q in front of your question. Um, It'll make it uh, go a little bit quicker in here. All right, where are we at here? Okay, Skynet says, at what age are hens and roosters no longer considered breeding stock and is a two-year-old still good to eat? Um, for me, I try not to breed any hens more than a year, and roosters about six months. I find the fertility goes down for the roosters at about six to eight months. Um, a two-year-old bird, I would still eat it. I don't find that age really makes a difference. Um, yeah, I haven't really specifically tested like an older bird versus a younger bird. It, to me, they all pretty much taste the same so yep. yeah I do pretty much the same um, I do exactly the same as far as uh, my breeders uh, but on the older birds uh, when I butcher my dog loves the quail so I kind of supplement yeah. his food let's see Brooke says uh, what is the recommended fiber percentage for grow outs so you mean fiber or protein uh, it says fiber yeah, yeah, I don't I'm know. Sure I've never. Paid yeah, and I don't. Fiber I don't even look at the fiber when I'm uh, buying my food. Yeah. Uh, Brody says, "What is your favorite color pattern for quail?" Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think probably would be. Hmm, I really love the calicos, but I really love the sparklies especially the um when you get the fees in in with the sparklies and you've got the the really dark and light contrast those are really mm -hmm. pretty too okay um looks like i got a question here wanting to know if i ship the tumblers to canada um i don't see why i couldn't i mean i could just box it up and take it to the post office um the only, the only thing that I could see would be a little bit different would be uh, the added cost of shipping. 
So we can try it once. Trevor says, is 30% protein for the quail's feed too much for their whole life? I don't think that they need to be on the 30% past the six weeks. Um, personally, what I do is, I, um, is I'll do the 30% um, grower up, or sorry, 30% starter up to six weeks. And then after six weeks, I'll do half and half the 30% plus just a regular chicken grower, which gives me about a, a I believe it's a 23 or 24% mm -hmm. protein um, feed. And then I, they do really well on that. Um, other people have other ideas about that, but I don't feel they need the full 30% all the way up. Right, and I do the um, same thing. <clears throat> I'm, I'm on 30% until they start laying eggs. Then I put them on a layer formula and that's 16 to 18%. Uh, sometimes yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put my growers, like I'll run them up to six weeks and then I'll put them on a 20% protein just to finish growing them up. But I have found that my, I don't know if my birds are just lazy or what, but they get fat when they're on 30% protein. And I, and I go to butcher them, I got a ton of fat on the birds, so. Yeah, I've heard that it's also not good for their kidneys to be on the 30% for an extended period of time, like the higher the protein it mm -hmm. builds up in their kidneys and things like that so um yeah i don't think it's necessary some people do keep them on 30 percent you know till they're two years old and they seem to do fine so i don't know it's more expensive that way too though. <coughs> uh moon outdoor says do you use apple cider vinegar for coccidiosis prevention for chicks no, I do not. I don't believe apple cider vinegar will help with coccidiosis. The only thing so. that will help with that um, is a is a medicated feed. Or if you're if you if you have problems with coccidiosis, then you can treat them with Ampol or um, whatever it's called down in the states. I'm not sure, but Ampolium. we don't uh, Ampolium. Yeah, we don't uh, substitute it with. Like we don't give them anything unless we notice a, a real problem is happening. But I haven't. It, I find the quail chicks don't run. I don't run into problems with coccidiosis very often. Yeah, I never have. Okay, Daniel. The says only time I'll go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say the only time I've ever really run into coccidiosis is if I have chicken chicks that I've been growing out in the brooder at the same time. Then sometimes it'll pop up. Gotcha. Okay, Daniel says, will Coternix quail breed in groups of 100 birds in an outdoor setting? Um, Coternix quail will breed in any setting. <laughs> um, unless there's not enough light, then then they'll, um, the males will go dormant. But if you have 100 birds in an outdoor setting, they will, they will definitely breed. Mm -hmm. um, the females may not brood. Um, if maybe that's what you're talking about, if they'll um, like naturally hatch their own. Um, I know a lot of times if they are in an outdoor setting, they are more likely to go broody, um, but when they're on wire in a, in a cage setting, like how I keep them, they do not. Okay. Uh, Joy says, what kind of record keeping system do you use? Um, I use an Excel spreadsheet and I will keep, um, I have, my quail banded with zip ties so I know which bloodlines they come from um, depending on the color of zip ties and things like that and then um, yeah once like I, I then I keep track of when I put those breeders in the in the breeding cages as well so I know when they need to be replaced okay Marius says from where you started with quail to where you are now, what would you have done different in the beginning to what you know now? And what is your biggest mistake that you've made with quail? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> what would I have done different? I don't know if I would have done anything different except maybe... Um, yeah, except maybe... I don't even know if I would have done anything different, maybe researched a little bit more in the beginning, but other than that, um, when I first got the quail, I was, you can ask my husband, I was reading everything about quail online, 
for like every single night. I was up till 11, 12 o'clock at night reading studies on quails and their, um, you know, their nutrition requirements and genetics and, and things like that. So um, I'm sure he got kind of annoyed with me for the first little bit because <laughs> I was paying more attention to my quail than to him. Um, but yeah. And then, sorry, what was the last part of that question? Um, oh, what is the biggest mistake you've made with your quail? Um, biggest mistake I've made with my quail is brooding too many quail together. Um, they pile up on top of each other, but that's mm -hmm. a pretty easy mistake to, to avoid. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest one, but now I know, obviously, that you don't do that, so... Let's see, Wes says, I have one quail that lays on its side and kicks, but if you mess with it, it will get up and act fine. Any ideas? Um, possibly a vitamin deficiency, or if you, any way it could have um, blown up and hit its head on the top of the cage. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll, they'll bonk their heads and then they'll, um, it'll kind of stun them for a little bit and or it can cause a neurological problem as well. I've run into that before. Um, not so much with these cages because they're lower, but when we first started, I had a higher cage. It was, uh, it was 24 inches, and I found that they would um, they would fly up and, and hit their heads sometimes, right. and then they would they would act off. Okay, uh, Moon Outdoors says, "What is the optimal weight you are looking for in your breeders?" I try to have my females above 350 um, for my jumbo lines and then regular lines I like to have my females around two, 290 to 300. Um, males I like to keep um, anything above 250 grams. Sorry, I, I use grams not ounces so you'll have to look that up. Okay, uh, Hendriette says, what is your ideal weight for a quality quail, and what do you do differently than others would do to get the perfect weight, to get your perfect weight? Um, I don't know if I do anything differently. Uh, I think I raise them pretty much the same way that um, everybody else will raise them. Um, but yeah, the weights that I just mentioned previously, those are the weights that I, I look for for my breeders. And yeah, I know some people will raise their, their birds in the dark um, so that all they do basically is eat and have very, very little light um, and they can get their weights up on their quail, but I don't feel that that's a genetic um, weight gain. I feel that's a, a situational weight gain and I want to concentrate more on a genetic weight gain than, a, than the situation they're raised in. Hey, Ron says, as a beginner, which trait should one start with? Um, I think it depends what your goal is. So if you're raising for meat and eggs, then I would look for your weights and your um, the egg laying ability and how well they lay. Um, some people will um, they'll look for uh, you know some traits. For some lines of quail, they won't get startled at predators or if you have, you know, say a big dog that comes up to the cage or anything like that, they'll look for the birds that aren't startled by that and will keep laying even after being startled. I know that's a trait that some people will look for as well. Um, I don't particularly look for that trait. I would concentrate more on the, the weights and the non-aggression mm -hmm. and the egg laying. Okay, uh, Trevor says, I placed my first batch of quail eggs in the incubator around 10 p.m. Would the day I set them be day zero or the next day? I, yeah, I find that my quail tend to hatch a little bit early, so I count it as day zero, even if I do put them in at like eight or nine o'clock at night, mm -hmm. and they still always hatch on day 17. Um, it might be a little bit later in the day, but I, I count it as day zero. Okay. Uh, let's see, Brooks says, I use sand for dust baths. It gets smelly with ammonia after about a week. 
I just used pine saw to spray the sand and it subsided a bit. What else can you recommend to keep the smell down in the dust bath? Um, I don't know if pine saw would be particularly good for the quail to be inhaling. That can be a pretty strong smell. Um, I don't know. I would maybe try using like a kitty litter scoop if it's if it's really bad. Try and get that out of there. But it shouldn't have an ammonia smell if it's in a dry spot. Um, right. Yeah, either that or just replace the sand. That's what I was going to say. I, it's sand is so cheap, you know, easy to replace. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rufus the bunny says uh, just joined. Uh, do you sell hatching eggs, and if so, where can I order? I do sell hatching eggs, but I only ship in Canada. Um, I don't ship to the States because of um, import and export laws. Um, but you can check out my website. It's www.essexcountyhatchery.com. And if you go to my Facebook page, you can, you can see the link to my website and everything like that. Okay, and he also has another question. He wants to know if those are Wynola Ranch cages. No, they're not. They're made from a um, from a local, well, three hours away, um, commercial rabbit cage uh, fabricator. Um, Ron Lee wants to know: uh, Does does he ship to the U.S. and ship the cages? I guess he wants to know if the, your cage manufacturer ships to the U.S. No, he doesn't. He, I think he will ship unassembled cages within Canada, but the shipping is really expensive in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you have to look for. By the time you end up shipping it, say, across, across the country, it'd probably be cheaper if you just went and bought sure. the materials yourself. Yep. Uh, Marius wants to know, do you ship to South Africa? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Okay, we already answered that question. Uh, Katrina says, Hi from Gilroy, California. Do you recommend an external humidifier for a hoverbaiter incubator? I am in a dry area, not humid, first time hatcher. An external humidifier? Um, I'm not sure that would really do any, you know, give you any benefit um, I usually dry hatch anyways like I, I incubate my eggs at about 30 percent 30 to 40 percent and then hatch at about 55 to 60 for my quail and I find that works really well but depending you know we have a pretty humid in the summertime especially it gets it gets really humid around here because we're right near the Great Lakes mm -hmm. but um, yeah that's what I generally keep my my humidity yet so you don't yeah, want to be incubating too high uh, right and if you're using a hoverbaiter I mean that's a small enough incubator you can just put uh, you, you know, just put the water inside. in the bottom yeah. yeah try it out for your first hatch and see what happens and uh, but I think you'll be fine yeah let's see Herman says what would you recommend on artificial lighting uh, installing a slow dimmer or just shut off um, mine just shut off. I've got my lights in the barn on a timer. They come on at about 5.30 in the morning and shut off about 10, 10 at night, 10.30 at night. But they just, they just shut off. And I haven't noticed that it does anything detrimental to the birds. They're all still laying really well. Um, yeah. So okay. I don't think it really makes a difference. Uh, William's got an answer to that uh, fiber question that we had earlier, and he says it's about 4%. Okay, thank you. Uh, Becky says, if you couldn't find a feed store, or if you couldn't find feed at the store due to a shortage or something, what would you feed them? Um, you could feed them, like if you just wanted to keep them alive, you can feed them vegetables and you know, bird seed and things like that, but you probably won't get very much laying out of them, but it'll keep them alive. Sure. Uh, Darla says, you mentioned people buying quail for pets. Do you sell as a pair or do you sell a few with a male? And what's the most common request? 
Um, usually, I have people that will want to buy a breeding set. So, like, four, four females and one male is what I sell my breeding sets for. Um, either that or they just buy chicks. Most of the time, it's just chicks, and then they'll raise them themselves. And if they have extra males, they usually end up bringing them back to me. So, hmm. that's fine by me. Sure. Uh, okay, Henriette says, what do you think is the reason for egg bounding in hens? Um, I think if you have too much light and they're overstimulated and, you know, just laying all the time, I think that can cause issues. I, I've only ever lost, I think, two hens to egg binding mm -hmm. the entire time I've been raising quail. So to me, it's not a popular thing that happens. I know there are some genetic bloodlines that are more prone to it happening. You know? Okay. Uh, Brody says, how do you replace your breeding stock? Um, I hatch out from my breeders and I have a, a pen of other breeders from bloodlines so I'll mix them up and to get the new bloodlines in and then hatch them out and then use those as my new breeders. Brooke says, <clears throat> you said you separate your color. What is your current breeding program and what colors are you trying to achieve? So right now I have, um, I've got silvers, German pastels, sparklies, um, my fee collection. So I've got the fab fee, um, pearl fee, and then uh, grau fee all in the same uh, pen. And then I've also got um, jumbo, Faro, Jumbo White, Jumbo Italian, um, Calicos, Blacks, um, and then I've got the red collection. So I, um, I have my red ranges, Scarlets, and Egyptians, and Autumn Ambers all in that, and I sell that as a collection. Um, later this year, once I get more birds and have the, um, get a few of the recessive genes out of there, bred out that I want to get out, then I'll be selling those. Um, individually as well so um, yeah. did are your silvers from uh, Perry yeah how far is he from you um I think a four-hour plane ride oh, okay <laughs> nice uh, Lindsay says when trying to pass on a certain quality say color uh, would it be better to focus on a roux with the desired trait since it can pass it on to many hens? It depends what I've got for breeding. If I have, say, just a hen with a specific color, then I'll have to use her and mm -hmm. use like a feral male or something like that. But yeah, generally, if you have a male that's the color that you want, then you can, it's definitely easier to, um, you know, get the different bloodlines in the same pen if you use different females, so. Okay. Uh, Nick says, how do you introduce roosters to an existing flock of breeding hens without them scalping each other? I had a couple of roosters that got the tar kicked out of them and one got scalped. <laughs> um, the best way to do that would be to take them all and put them all in a box for a little bit and then reintroduce them into a different cage where there's it's all neutral ground and so the hens don't have their pecking order established at that point because they're in a new cage, new surroundings and it just messes up the hens. I, I have run into that problem before though so I know what you're talking about. Um, some people also say to um, dilute um, vinegar in a spray bottle and spray the birds down, um, not their heads obviously but just their backs and uh, so that it neutralizes any smell that could be on them so that they all smell the same. Um, I haven't experimented with that yet, but I find just putting them all in a new cage, you know, on neutral grounds really mm. helps. Yep, that's exactly what I do. And I haven't had, I don't think I've had any birds this year, you know, get beat up. Yeah. Um, Kirsten says, at what point in the hatching do you give up on the remaining eggs? Also, how long do you keep the babies in the incubator 
before opening? I've heard mixed responses. So for my hatches, for the quail, I'll take them out usually at 8 to 12 hour interval intervals or when I notice that there's a slow, like a, a break in the hatch and I don't keep anything past 19 days because I don't want to be breeding the, the late hatching into my, into my birds. And I also find anything past 19 days um, generally tend to be really weak or have curled legs or, um, or crooked necks and things like that. So I just, yeah, I'll scrap the, the eggs at day 19 usually. Yep. Um, okay, so you got that. Let's see here. Uh, Trevor says, I recently had a celadon hen pass away and looked at the back end and saw it was bulged and swelled around the vent. Do you think it was egg bound or infected? Um, sounds like it could have been a prolapse. Um, yeah, if it's if it's red and bulging, it could be yeah, egg binding that turned into a prolapse or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you could actually feel back there and see if the if it was egg bound, you could feel the egg right there. So. Yeah, you can feel it if you, if you um like just feel around the vent, and you can sometimes if you push hard enough, you can feel the cracking of the the egg inside. So yeah. that would be your clue. Uh, Mad Mimi says, I just had my first successful hatch of five eggs. Congratulations. They will be eight weeks old on the 25th. I know I have two males, but suspect they are all boys. When do I separate them? Um, if they're all boys, do you have anything to separate them? Like any hens to separate them to? Um, some people will keep a bachelor pen together and have success with them as long as they don't have too much light so they're not getting um, sexually mature and beating each other up and trying to mate each other because the males will they will do that if they're given enough light right and if you keep them out of earshot of any hens uh, that helps a lot yeah. too yeah okay Herman says can you incubate different types of quail eggs at the same time is there any difference you can incubate different types of Coternix together at the same time. Um, the color of the Coternix doesn't, um, it won't affect the hatch, the date of the hatch. If you incubate, say, Bob Whites and Coternix, then your Bob Whites are going to hatch at a later date. So I have hatched them together, but what I do is I put my Bob Whites in first, and then about five days later, I'll add the, the Japanese Coternix to the okay to the incubator so that they'll hatch at the same time. But I don't recommend brooding the Bob Whites and uh, Japanese Coternix together though. Right. Uh, Aaron's Acre Coternix Farm wants to know, how many quail do you have? Right now I have about 400. Uh, Doc Holliday says, I know you said the blacks were aggressive, but which ones are your most peaceful? Um, my most peaceful? Um, my jumbo whites that I have are really docile, um, which is rare for whites, but I have zero aggression with them. Um, my calicos are very, very, um, very docile as well. Um, my jumbo pharaohs are very docile. My pastels are docile. Um, yeah, they're, they're all pretty, pretty good. Okay. Yeah, it's funny because my blacks are not aggressive at all. I mean, they they meet me at the door and I can pet them and everything. You know, they're they're really friendly. Yeah, the two that I have left, my pair that I have now, they're they're really nice and they, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't know what was with the the one hen that I had, but I ended up losing her. But she was super aggressive and beat up the male and the all the other hens that I had. So. Um, okay, we are at the bottom of our questions. Guys, if you have any questions, we've still got about 10 minutes left. Um, go ahead and uh, post them now. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything over here. I don't think I did. Um, yeah, if you got any more questions, go ahead and post them real quick. Uh, okay, there's one right there. Uh, CW says, when processing a quail, what are the yellow balls inside of them? Greetings from the UK. <laughs> The yellow balls would probably be the 
the eggs that are um, that haven't formed yet. That's what I. So that's most likely a female. Yep. Yeah. If he's processing hens, that's most likely our our yeah. eggs, and uh, males. They're actually testicles inside there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that was our last question. Uh, I am going to go ahead and announce the two winners of the uh, Caternix Corner tumblers, and then we'll see if there's any other questions come in. Uh, we got about nine minutes left, guys, so if you have any more questions, go ahead and post them now. Um, the first winner is Lindsay Norman, and the second winner is Becky Adis. And if both of you could... Uh, either email me or uh, message me on the Facebook group page your shipping information. I will get those uh, tumblers out. There they are right there. I will get them out, uh, what's today, Friday, first thing uh, Monday morning. Okay. Uh, Jonathan says, good morning, Nicole and Terry. It's nice meeting up with the live chat from Nigeria. Welcome to the show, oh, Good Jonathan. morning. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> okay, um, I don't see any other questions, so thank you, Verna, for putting my email address up there, terry at paternixcorner.com. I guess that really helps. Um, is there anything that you would like to add, uh, Nicole? I mean, you did a wonderful job tonight. Um, I don't think so. It's been a pleasure. Well, um, have you and uh, Kristen been talking about new subject matter for the uh, uh, Paternix Quail 101 shows? Yeah. Can yeah, you give us a little insight into what's coming up? Um, I think the next one she's doing is nutrition. Um, or is that the cages that she's doing? I'll have to look at it again. And then mm -hmm. we'll probably be talking about um, quail setups, um, you know, I'll go through one day and uh, go through my cages and automatic waters and things like that. And um, when are you coming yeah. back on? I don't think I'm back on till June. Okay. Um, June twelfth. Yeah, June twelfth. Um, Lindsay wants to know uh, what the web address is to your uh, website. Oh, it's www dot essex county hatchery dot com okay. and i also have a facebook page too if you look up essex county quail and poultry it'll come up on facebook um okay i got a couple of quick questions here we'll knock this out i got one for me uh, skynet wants to know he used the uh, kitchen drawer liner material for his incubator uh question is do you clean the drawer liners and reuse them or discard them i do I reuse them. I take them out back, hose them down real good, and I just let them sit in the sun for a few hours so they dry, and that pretty much will kill anything that's growing on them. Uh, Jay says, I have special needs pen. One is pretty much blind, and one is a predator survivor. Any chance they will ever be able to be integrated into our main pen, uh, 40 Quail Covey? If so, how? Um, probably not, especially if they're... Um, disabled, the quail will pick up on that, and I find that they tend to um, to beat them up. So, yeah, I mean, you could try, but I doubt it would work, especially with an already established covey. Right. Okay, oh, we've got one more question here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce your name, so I'm not even going to try. How do you stop quail from screeching at night? Do you recommend a red light? Um, like the males crowing in the middle of the night, I don't think there is anything you can really do to stop that, um, except by not giving them any light at all. I know when we had our, our quail in the backyard in town, um, they would screech because they could see this, you know, the lights, the street lights, and it kept them up. Um, but where we are now, it's, we're out in the county and it's completely dark here at night, so they, they're quiet all night long. Right. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap it up tonight. Um, guys, I want to thank everybody uh, that stopped in and uh, asked the questions. They were all great questions. Um, again, uh, Lindsay Norman and Becky Adis, 
uh, email me your uh, info and I will get your tumblers out to you right away. Nicole, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very I'm, welcome. I'm glad you were able to get in, um, you know, to reschedule because I tried it before where we couldn't reschedule and it just messes up the whole schedule. So, um, guys, join us next week. We got Allie from Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. She's going to be joining us Tuesday, so not even a week from now. And, uh, yeah, that ought to be a really interesting show. So, um, other than that, everyone have a great night. Again, thank you, Nicole. Thank you guys no for uh, the questions. And we'll see you all over on Facebook. <laughs> all right. Take care. <laughs> have a good one.